Hello and welcome to the Ludic Insights Podcast. This series explores themes and topics relating to all things digital and digital's impact on our society's leadership and ways of getting things done. My name is Garrick Jones, I'm from the Ludic Group and I'm a co-author of the book Alive, Digital Humans and Their Organizations, available on Amazon, Kindle and bookstores near you. And I'm with here my co-author and uh, fellow business partner, Paul Ashcroft. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined today by uh, Simon Brown, who's Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. Hi, Simon. Hi. Good to talk to you both. Thanks so much for being with us today. Simon, we would love to have a conversation with you about the future of learning. We know Novartis um, and have had the pleasure of working with your organization for many years and have really seen that um, it's actually an example of a company that is pushing the boundaries and starting to shape what is the future of learning? Um, just for a bit of context, could you just tell us a little bit about um, Novartis as an organization and what's its ambition for learning? Yeah, so we're 100,000 people globally. Uh, we're a focused medicines company. So we, we help to reimagine medicine uh, around the world. Last year, we touched over 800 million patients. We took the decision earlier this year to go big on learning. So we've made it a, a, an ambition of ours to offer the best learning and development opportunities uh, possible to our associates, which means we have a very interesting journey ahead of us as we work to try and realize that ambition. That is a brave ambition. What, why did you go for that? Why is that a strategic imperative to focus on learning? Yeah, so there were, there were three reasons. One was around associates demanding access to learning. So we see... Uh, a lot of external research around millennials in particular uh, wanting access to learning, great learning opportunities, high performers wanting access to great learning. Uh, second reason is around how learning is changing. So we're seeing a move towards bite-sized learning, just-in-time learning, uh, much sort of shorter access of learning. And then the other end of the spectrum, we see longer programs, massive open online courses, um, university certifications, and things. And we need, as a company need to make sure we're offering uh, opportunities in all of those areas and third reason being it's around needing to enhance learning to support the business strategy so for us as a company a number of the areas we're working towards we need new capabilities whether that's data and digital whether that's commercial excellence uh, as well as seeing um, the speed of acceleration so seeing new to world skills coming of things that didn't exist before seeing skills people have today becoming irrelevant um, some of the, the Gartner research says 20% of the skills that people have today will be uh, irrelevant in three years' time. So you see that sort of data there, which means we, we need to be getting good at, at rebuilding skills, at developing people. So for those three reasons, attraction, retention of talent, that how people learn changing and the business needs it, that created a compelling argument for us to go big on learning. And, and an organization of 100,000 people spread geographically all over the world, that's not an easy task. What are some of the things that you're seeing as some of the sort of biggest challenges that that uh, you're going to come you're going to come up to soon? And that was exactly my question too. How do they do it? How do you do it, uh, given the digital <laughs> and everything that's available to you today? Uh, it, it's hard. <laughs> that's uh, that's part of the challenge. Three parts in there. So one one is around creating a, a culture for continuous learning. Uh, so that includes, you know, in detail, looking at the learner experience, how people want to access learning. It involves looking at our curriculum and what's core content that goes across the world. Uh, we then have a stream around the business impact of learning. So how do we build capability at scale across the organization? How do we use data to support um, what we're doing in learning? Because historically, we've not been great at, at using data or, or even understanding the learning data that's out there and linking that to business data. Um, around the marketing of learning and in using that as an attraction retention piece. And then there's how we create an efficient and effective learning organization. We have over a thousand people across the organization involved in learning. So how do we organize that? How do we have our corporate university? Where does that sit? How, what do we have centralized? And how do we work across the central teams and divisional teams? Uh, how do we build capability across our learning professionals around the world? So we have a strategy with those three pillars. Uh, we have a series of projects in there that we're, we're working towards next. There's a strategy in place and a lot of ac activity already in place. But if we think sort of more broadly, say two to three years into the future, learning and how people will learn is going to change. You even just said this, the skills they need, even in that short time frame, is going to change probably quite dramatically. 
What do you imagine would be a great learning experience? What type of experience would you like to create um, for associates there in learning in two to three years' time? I think my sense is you probably need to almost separate different learner, learning experiences. So uh, partially you go down into the sort of performance support side of things. So there's something I want to do and I need access to something to learn how to do it at the time that I need it. Uh, and there I think um, we'll see a lot of developments on the technology side and particularly on the artificial intelligence side. The technology has the promise there to actually be able to understand who you are, what you're doing, and be able to offer up uh, insights, whether that's knowledge, whether that's bite-sized learning, or whether that's more in-depth learning, or even connection to an expert or connection to talk to someone else in the organization that is, uh, is doing that. And then at the other end of the spectrum is actually I need to reskill or build skills in something new, and there we need to offer effective, longer-term learning journeys with, with flexible content. Um, and, and if I look, I have a, a busy diary, but so I need the learning to fit in around my diary, whether that's you know, stuff I can listen to in the car on the way to work, on the way home, whether that's stuff I can download to my device, uh, and it needs to be engaging and, and interesting and actually you know, reinforce the learning over time. So we need to offer you know, impactful, flexible learning solutions that fit in with our busy schedules uh, to build out those, those deeper skills as well. And it sounds that to me that you're describing, and, and I've heard this phrase coined sort of a personal learning cloud that sort of a learning that sits around the individual providing access as a and when they need it board of learning opportunities well, tailored to what they need when they need it mm. um, i guess but that's essentially the holy grail right yeah well, and the other part of that is how do you know you said it simon how do we know what people want how do we keep track of what they need from learning perspective and marry that to the organization's needs as well strategically tactically and so on um what are your views on, on, I know we're not asking you to be clairvoyant, but we are uh, interested in, you know, given someone who's really right at the cutting edge of all of this, what do you think the direction might be in terms of how the organizations will be able to keep track and know what people need and then serve them what they require? Uh, I think it, it comes back to data ultimately. So if we, and if we look to the consumer experience, and we've all heard references to you know, having a more Netflix-like experience, more Amazon-like experience, uh, you know, those, those are built through data uh, and good data of understanding uh, the consumer or the user and good data around understanding the product. There's a role we all have to play around understanding data in that, making sure we have good data around our users uh, and good data around our content and ultimately then get that more Netflix-like or uh, Amazon-like experience that understands this is who I am, this is the role that I'm doing, this is where I am in the workflow, or this is, these are the systems that I'm using, or these are the, rest of the types of issues that someone would typically be wrestling with, and these are the things that have helped other people like you at these points, uh, or that we can suggest, and then build in the, the machine learning, so you know, crowdsourcing, or you know, people like this or don't like this, mm. this is useful, this isn't useful, and then learn from that over time, and those algorithms get stronger and better. Mm. And, and before you know it, you're starting to get like Amazon, it's, <laughs> oh, oh, I was just thinking of buying that, and now it's offering it up uh, just at the time that I was thinking about it. A virtual classroom I can book myself on next week, and oh, it's already in my diary, great. Uh, yeah. So how do we get to, to understand people to that level? And ultimately, I think it, it comes down to to data uh, and then also making sure the content is there which means understanding the business strategy and understanding mm. you know, what skills we need to be building and then uh, finding the right uh, ways to build those in the most effective way exactly you start to talk a little bit about how learning will ma the learning experience will manifest for a learner and you give one example of driving in the car and you being able to access an audio file or speak to somebody or watching video on demand etc etc um what about more broader channels of learning from, you know, from face to face to peer learning, social learning, um, uh, learning from experts? How does that all come together? And what have you seen that works? I think it's all around finding the right medium for the right um, need. So we, we get new channels, we get new technologies, we get new tools, but, but ultimately it's around you know, what is the right medium for what we're trying to achieve and that may be based upon a scale piece of you know if i need to reach 
100,000 people, then I probably need to do something virtual. Um, if it needs to be a deep mindset shift, then probably sending them a piece of e-learning or, or a short video isn't going to bring about a deep mindset shift. If it's something where it's complex and it needs reinforcement and whatever, then you know, I'd probably better build a, a journey over time or some more more intensive uh, way of doing it. So it's finding the right blend across all of those different channels based upon what the, the learning need is, what the mindset shift or change of behavior is, you know, who the audience is, where they're physically located, how much time can they commit to it, you know, does it need a... Uh, an expert facilitator, or is it something to be self-learned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So building the right combination of all of those tools in terms of getting a, an optimum um, solution to do whatever is needed. And, and there's often no absolute right answer in this. It's finding the right mix. And presumably providing content in multiple ways so that people can access it in the way that best suits them as well. Yeah, where it's where it makes sense to do so, um, and and so yeah, it, it's possible, um, and particularly if it's a, if it's a scale solution, then having flexibility around it. But um, you know, sometimes building a classroom course, building an e-learning course, building a virtual course, it may not be practical to do it on in all all mediums. Um, so it's what's what's the most effective one or the most scalable one um, for the given need, and obviously the more people. The greater the scale, maybe the more flexibility around options that one can build in. Um, when you throw in language and other things, though, you know, it, it does add to the complexity of it and, and possibly the range of solutions. Mm. I was interested in, given your vision for learning at Novartis, Simon, um, in two to three years, what would you, what would be, if you achieved everything you wanted to achieve, what would be the, the take home that people understood about learning at Novartis? Uh, I think it would be around. Uh, living up to our, our culture around being curious um so we have a culture around curious inspired and unbossed um and part of that curious piece would be, would include sort of continuous learnings but uh yeah the, the ultimately i think the probably the biggest thing is the having the right mindset around being curious and having that desire to continuously mm -hmm. learn uh, and looking for what's the what's the new knowledge what's the new skill that they they would like to learn and us as a learning function behind the scenes, making sure we're providing them with, with fantastic solutions in order to be able to build those skills and meet that curiosity, whether that's things we're producing ourselves, whether that's things we're empower empowering others across the organization to be producing, or whether that's things we're, we're partnering with people outside of the organization to give access to you know, best of breed content as well. Can we ask a personal question, Simon? Um, <laughs> What's been we talked about? <laughs> we've talked about learning, depending on what it is. We we talked about sort of learning experience. What's been, if you think inside or outside of work, but what's been your most memorable experience of learning that you can think back on? So one more recent one was, um, and we just launched um, access to uh, MOOCs through 190 universities across the the world um, for all associates. So that's a major step forward in the last few days where uh, all of our associates get access to this selection of 3,000 MOOCs. Um, but if, before we did that, I thought, okay, if we're going to ask people to do this, I'd probably better go through one of them myself and see you know, the experience. So uh, I went through a four-week program, uh, three to five hours per week, uh, in order to you know, see in, in a busy schedule, is it possible <laughs> to fit this in? Um, and, and actually, you know, it's a realistic ask of associates to commit the time to do it. Uh, so that was a pretty memorable experience in terms of you know, watching a series of short three to five minute videos of an SME going through. The topic was uh, agile and design thinking. Um, and so, yeah, watch those videos, listen to some at home, listen to some at work, listen to some in the car, on the way in and out of uh, work in the car. Uh, got to the first week quiz, failed that, realized, okay, I probably need to pay a bit more attention to these videos. So uh, then went back, listened to a few more of those. Um, and then passed the quiz in the first week, went through similarly with the second week, found the car was a, a really effective way for me to learn. So while I couldn't see the videos, actually that was a bit secondary that I could listen to the audio and, and get sort of 45 minutes a day of uninterrupted time to be able to listen through. And if I needed to re-listen to it, then, then the opportunity was there. Um, yeah. The assignments that you did, I know end of week three, end of week four, there were assignments. Um, so that I did a uh, mixture of uh, at home and a bit of work in order to be able to write the assignments. Uh, I managed to do the, some of the peer review while sitting in an airport, uh, in a, having it on the go. 
uh, managed to download the videos onto the phone. So you know, spending an hour cycling in the gym, I can have the, the phone sat in front of me and I can go through watch the videos, do the quiz and work out, do the exercise at the same time. So you know, it would have been essentially dead time. I'd have my music on or have Netflix on. Actually, I could spend that time learning. Um, so I managed to fit it in into the daily um, into the daily diary without actually needing to you know, massively block out big sections of the diary in order mm. to be able to learn. So uh, the book, yeah, it's one of our one of the questions I was going to ask. How you find time to learn? I think you've yeah. answered it there. Is that you you don't make new time to learn? You just learn in and around exactly the travel time, day. dead time, um, as well as you know blocking a bit here and there uh, in order to get a bit more more unbroken time if it needs concentration. But uh, yeah, it was um, it wasn't easy. I think the four week course took me six weeks because I had to you know, move the deadlines out a little bit. But it was it was became possible, and it was getting into some good habits there of, of what works. Uh, around around how the diary was for that period, so so that was a very memorable one. The, the human is not going anywhere, I don't think, outside of learning. We still human to face to face, human to human interaction is one of the things that that drives and motivates us. But I was interested, if I reflect on this, what you were saying, the AI comp, comp, there is a huge role for AI, and there's a huge role for the development of AI and algorithms. But it seems to be focused not where we thought it would be, which is in delivering learning but actually in understanding the needs of the learner and being able to ensure that learning is delivered on time and at the right level and with the right kind of learning to the learner. so it's it's right at the beginning of the of the process or the journey if you think would that would that be accurate reflection i think it is so so yes but i could also see it merging more into the uh involvement in the learning process as well so uh, I think the, the the gap at the moment that I see is this, this matching piece of, of matching people to content, people to knowledge, people to people. Um, but you could start to see that then merging a bit more with if you stick a chatbot front end, let's say on there, then maybe I'm actually interacting with a chatbot to help guide access, so, uh, that that learning. Maybe it's guiding the access to learning, but maybe over time it's actually guiding. In, in being involved in the learning and uh, I'm already starting to explore with using um, an AI coach, for example, um, a, a, can that coaching interaction be done through AI? Um, so you could see how a chatbot potentially could actually help you to, to learn as well. Um, and if, you, if you're fast forwarding three years, I suspect we'll see a lot more of that, uh, that starting to be tested out at least. Uh, whether it's mainstream by then, I don't know, but I'm sure it will will start to be tested out of interacting with a chatbot to learn. Uh, Sam, what other top of mind examples uh, do you have of where things are really uh, shifting forwards, both within Novartis and perhaps things that you're seeing more broadly in the learning industry, where people are starting to try th something new or push the boundaries today? So we've had a few uh, successes now with virtual reality. Um, in uh, Austria, we used it for uh, manufacturing around line clearance. So you get a manufacturing line that has the, uh, the medicines and the packaging coming down and between different batches, you have to make sure it's completely cleared down. And we recreated that through virtual reality. So you go through the whole line clearance process. Uh, I think it had a, a return on investment of about four or five weeks because we could just avoid shutting down the line for training and actually do the line uh, completely through virtual reality. Um, so that was very effective. We used it for onboarding as well in the US, uh, again, in a sort of manufacturing environment. So I think that's starting to become quite mature now as a technology for certain use cases. Um, I think the, the interesting opportunity is starting to move from that virtual reality into augmented reality, where you're actually seeing the physical machines in real real life, but with an augmented layer through a, a visor or a sort of Google Glass type or HoloLens type uh, mechanism and actually guiding someone through real time or even having an expert seeing what you're doing and being able to guide you from afar to be able to sort of see what you're doing. Uh, the virtual reality we're, we're reasonably sort of moving forward with the augmented reality is more a direction I think I want to be doing more. And yeah, I think we agree. I think the augmented reality... Uh technology is really exciting because it's obvious to see application where you see an engineer for example seeing a schematic of a, an engine or a machine that they're needing to work on and they are overlaying directly what they they need to do and they may be even instructed on what to do in the field um, 
but equally that applies in business processes you you could be in a conversation with somebody uh, maybe a little bit spooky but then you are being fed or you're being presented with useful models frameworks references data even that's helping informing the conversation i mean that's as i say a little scary but um perhaps it's uh, the future as well and the obvious one of course is medical and professionals um and and playing with real data into a kind of medical situation is becoming Oh, uh, it's it's going so fast that technology is astonishing how how quickly I think, I think two to three years almost seems too far out now the way things are going kind of mad. So so, so we talked um, a little bit about the future. If there was one thing from the future that you could switch the light on and do today, make, do today make a reality today, what what would have the biggest impact? Do you think? Um, on people's experience of learning, if you could drag that forward to today, uh, I think for me it's that um, it's that understanding of learning and matching. So the sort of the AI linkaging piece, because I mean, if I look, we we have um, tens of thousands of different learning solutions. We probably have millions of knowledge articles or websites or whatever. We have, certainly have a hundred thousand people around the world, all with. You know, very valuable skills and experiences, uh, but we have imperfect knowledge in that system to be able to match up that this person knows the answer to the thing that you're wrestling with, but we can't link you to that person at the time that you need it. Or if what you need is on this web page, but you can't find it in the corporate intranet, or you know, buried in that learning management system, there's the perfect module to solve exactly what you're wrestling with at the moment, but uh, we can't find it. So uh, I think something that can do that matching of people to content to solutions at the right time could be so, so powerful for and realize, I guess, value out of all the stuff that exists out there that currently maybe isn't being utilized to the, to the same extent. I'm sure we have you know, fantastic content out there that people would um, hugely benefit from and we're just not able to get the right thing to the right person at the right time. And you know, as a, as a as a learning team, as a learning function, but also probably as a learning industry, you know, that there's huge amounts of our work that doesn't get valued to the extent it should because we can't get it to the right person at the right time where they truly need it. Uh, if we can solve that, we can unlock that that value in in what we're all doing probably day to day. Simon, one more question. We know that over the past number of years, Novartis have been on a real shift to digital, which is a huge uh, change and culture change in the organization itself what have what has the organization been doing in terms of learning to support that shift for its associates yeah so going big on uh, data science and digital is part of one of one of our five strategic imperatives so it's, it's a huge piece of the company um, we've been supporting it from a learning perspective probably for the last year 18 months now um, we came up with a digital capability building strategy where we segmented the audience. So we had uh, leaders, uh, practitioners, and uh, all associates with different learning needs for those different segments. Uh, for the leaders, uh, we're rolling out a digital immersion for leaders. So it's a three to four hour hands-on simulation uh, where people go through leadership challenges and uh, get hands-on with different digital tools, make decisions, and see the impact of those decisions. For our practitioners, we have a, a range of solutions, including access to massive open online courses, e-learning uh, around sort of in-depth in Python and Spotfire and various sort of data science programs, etc. Uh, and then for all associates, we launched about a year ago now, April last year, um, a digital awareness hub, uh, which is a two to three hour gamified learning experience where people work through video-based, uh, essentially a, a short MOOC, um, to learn what digital means for novartists, what it means for our associates, what it means for patients, uh, and really understanding, really demystifying, I guess, what, what digital is. Um, we're now a year on. We've had 24,000 people uh, access it, spending on average about half an hour uh, per person learning about uh, digital. The Gamify part has badges, and we've had over 14,000 badges earned. Uh, I think we're on about 1,700 digital champions now. So that's been a, a very effective for a voluntary program. So we've had 24,000 people go through it. Um, it's something we're pretty proud of uh, to start to build that that digital awareness across the company. A great success and a nice story. And, and Simon, are you seeing the 
impact of that with people that have been through the learning there in terms of their attitude to digital and their willingness to um, be part of that change? I think we're certainly seeing uh, a lot of excitement around it. We're certainly seeing people want to be involved in the project, seeing people wanting to know how do they build the skills uh, and, and taking up those deeper learning uh, opportunities that are there. So, yeah, I think it, we, we're not hearing, or at least I'm not hearing the question anymore of what is digital. Um, and the goal, the goal was to demystify it. So uh, I think for significant parts of the company, we, we, that goal is starting to be achieved around you know, understanding what we mean now when we say uh, digital is important for us. That's brilliant. Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for joining us today for this podcast. Thank you, Simon. My pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Absolutely. Good to talk to you both. Well, thank you for listening to this edition of Ludic Insights. Please subscribe and we look forward to your company next time.